Thousands of tenants in the past year were forced from their high-rise apartments after the buildings they call home failed safety audits. With power, water, and heat shut off, as a result, residents scrambled for accommodation in an already extremely tight rental market. Part of a generation of purpose-built rentals, some now approaching 70 years old, such buildings are a crucial part of the rental market, housing many thousands across the GTA. But can they be kept available, safe, and affordable? Let's find out. As we ask, Toronto City Councillor Kristen Wong Tam, Tony Irwin, President and CEO of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario, Shawita Gupta, Policy Analyst, Federation of Metro Tenants Associations, and Mark Wiseletter, Senior Partner at RealEstateLawyers.ca LLP. And it's great to have three of you here who have been here before. Tony, first time for you, so we're glad to have you here for the first time. Thank you, Steve. Let us, we want to just set up this discussion with some information. So I will ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring the following graphics up so we can take everybody through this. We're going to report the results of a number of surveys uh, reported by more than 2,800 tenants living in high-rise rental buildings in Toronto. More than half reported that their buildings had pest infestations, cockroaches being the most common. Nearly 20% said their buildings were beset with multiple kinds of pest infestations. Half of whom have pests and vermin said the problems were persistent. More than a third said the elevators in their buildings break down monthly or more. Roughly a third reported ventilation issues and 12% reported mold. Now those figures are going back to 2011. It's a United Way survey. Let's do a somewhat more updated one. We're gonna to continue to look. This is one in four families now in aging high rises living in a state of disrepair. Tenants reporting repair issues were outstanding despite repeated requests and formal complaints to landlords. Parents reporting their children's health was at risk due to mold, excessive cold and excessive heat. And that's a U of T study that came out in 2014. Okay, Joey, I wanna get you in on this first. You represent uh, tenants here. Are these issues, I mean, we pointed out those surveys are 2011 and 2014. Is it better today? I wish I could say that they were, Steve, but the trends that you observe in the 2011 study and the 2014 study continue to the present. Uh, there were subsequent studies put out by the Wellesley Institute that cite many of the same facts and figures and point out that this is an ongoing issue and make an important link with the question of health equity. Uh, more recently, ACORN, which uh, Toronto also points out that this trend is ongoing. So the state of disrepair of high-rise rental apartments has many implications beyond the fact that it means that tenants are living in unsafe places. It has implications for the vertical concentration of poverty and the state of our neighborhoods. I don't want to be too alarmist, but what's, this, what's the worst thing you've heard? Well, the worst thing I've heard is the worst thing we've all heard. And for that, I'm going to go across the pond to the United Kingdom. And we've, of course, heard about the Grenfell Towers and the complete disaster that that took place in 2017. And 70 people lost their lives. Fortunately, nothing to that scale has happened in Toronto, I'm pleased to say. But we've had some instances in the last year. I think you referred to 650 Parliament Street and, of course, the buildings on Wellesley Street where many tenants were displaced because of power outages and hydro shutdowns. Kristen Wongtem, in your view, what's the root of this problem? Uh, largely the lack of preventative maintenance. I think that landlords have not been keeping up with the state of repair. Uh, there seems to be no orderly system in structures in terms of how they actually uh, respond to tenant complaints and concerns. Uh, and then the City of Toronto and all cities and municipalities uh, need to do a better job of keeping uh, the, that uh, that particular um, disorder uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in more order, more structure. And that's uh, partly what the City of Toronto has been trying to do, uh, but it still requires uh, property owners and property operators uh, cooperation. That takes me to Tony. What do you think is going on here? Well, I think obviously those are you know concerning statistics. No one wants to live in a building that has uh, mold or is, has uh, you know, all manner of these problems that you have uh, outlined in these surveys. Uh, Yes, buildings are old. Uh, yes, some have not been maintained the way they should be. Certainly the members within our group uh, take this you know, maintenance very seriously. We have a certified rental building program within our membership where buildings have to be certified. They're independently audited. They have to maintain certain standards. Unfortunately, not every building is part of our, not every language is part of our group, and not every building is part of that program. So there's always more that can be done uh, to make these, make buildings better, but and certainly we have examples of uh, buildings that um, have taken, uh, have, have changed ownership, 
West Lodge was in the media last week. They now are owned by a different company who is uh, trying to address the maintenance, the deferred maintenance that needed to be done. It's thousands of work orders. It's going to take time to get it up to a better standard. But those are some positive stories within, uh, you know, some, some unfortunate circumstances that need to be improved. How much time do you figure? Well, the, the West Lodge Towers, they've, um, Timber Creek has owned them now for about six months. Uh, they've just put in a whole new heating system. Uh, elevators have been fixed, not all of them. Uh, some of them have been fixed. There's more to be done. It's going to take probably, you know, they outlined sort of set a target the first two years to really deal with a lot of the major sort of issues and try to get a lot of the back, uh, backlog of maintenance requests filled. Mark, this is your business to uh, sort of pay attention to the increasing tensions between tenants and landlords. Do you think it's getting... Easier? Worse? What do you, what's your view? It's a good question. You mentioned the fact that a lot of these buildings are 50, 60 years old. And many of them were built by people who were, owned these buildings for like the last 40 to 50 years, and they just ran them the way they ran them. And for them, they would go to the tenants, and they realized that they couldn't recover that much in the way of repair costs by increasing the rent. And so... They just didn't have that motivation to update the buildings the way they should be updated. That was part of the problem. But as I've seen, a lot of these people have passed buildings on to the next generation or perhaps a REIT or a public company that's buying rental housing. Well, these people... You should just say a, a REIT, R-E-I-T? Yes. You yes. want to explain what that is? For Real Estate Investment them. Trust. So Income you're, you're, trust, you're yeah. seeing large companies buy rental housing. These people have to answer to their shareholders as well. And so they've recognized, I believe, uh, positively that you got to put money into these buildings and fix them up. And if you do it right and fix them up, then you could go to the landlord and tenant board and get a small increase even above uh, the guidelines. Mm -hmm. And uh, it results in a better living standard for the tenants and they have to pay a little bit more rent for it. So I'm finding that those stories you may not read as much about, you read about the terrible buildings, but I, what I see out there is a lot of good landlords taking over these buildings, recognizing the value and realizing we better put money in right, if you, we want to make these buildings mm -hmm. gain in value over the years. You talk about a story that's out there, and, and I think, let, let's hit that on the head right now. There is a narrative out there that says, that the landlords are money-grubbing, bad, evil people who are letting their buildings deteriorate, uh, and the poor tenants, uh, who all they want to do is live in a nice place and mm. you know mm -hmm. pay a reasonable rent, are getting screwed over. That's the narrative. Mm. I want to know how true that is. Kristen, what do you say? Well, I mean, certainly in the neighborhoods that I represent, which includes St. James Town, uh, which has a large number of these towers, and there's about 30 to 400 across the city. This is downtown Toronto That's for those downtown who live Toronto, outside yes. the area. That's downtown Toronto, yes. And so there's 3,400 of these residential towers across the city that are over three stories tall and have more than 10 units. 50% of them approximately are reaching that age of uh, 60 years and older. Um, and so when you have that old uh, sort of housing stock and it hasn't been well kept, uh, has not been well maintained, uh, the investments have not been made in a timely fashion, a lot of those end of life systems uh, that are, make up a building are coming to the end. And, uh, and so what I'm seeing in the downtown area and across Toronto uh, is uh, landlords not doing their job and not keeping up the state of repair, which is which is why those statistics that you read off at the beginning of the show are not um, surprising at all, and that's actually quite commonplace uh, and uh, and right across uh, the city of Toronto. Tony, let me get you to speak to that narrative that is that is out there in some quarters. Absolutely, it's out there. Obviously, I think it is uh, not representative of the entire um, industry. Not all things is, is ever all one way. Um, it, you know, no industry is perfect. There always are bad apples, and I'm not going to suggest that what uh, Councillor Wontam has said is not true. We we know there are a lot of old buildings uh, that are reaching the end of their life cycle in certain pretty significant ways. So we know that. Uh, but in terms of you know the, the members that I represent, I mean these are. Uh, companies, some are large, some are medium, some are small. They really want to do the right thing. They want to provide uh, good housing, uh, safe, uh, you know, re reliable housing for their tenants. It's expensive to do, and there are challenges around being able to, as we spoke about already, uh, how do you pay for these improvements? You know, I mean, the money has to come from somewhere, and so uh, we live in a rent control system, as we know. That does have limitations, obviously, on what, how, rents, how much rents can go up by. 
The above guideline increase situation is one that des des deserves some further discussion and hopefully we'll get to it. Uh, there are challenges in, in that uh, sort of system uh, that's made it much more adversarial and, and difficult for uh, both landlords and tenants to navigate that system. So how do we go about paying for these improvements? Yes, some companies are coming in and buying distressed buildings perhaps and are willing to invest millions of dollars into them. Uh, that's, we're starting to see that. Perhaps that needs to happen more. Uh, but there really needs to be, I think, governments and, and industry, we need to work together to figure out how do we sort of come up with, improve the system so that landlords can figure out ways to work with tenants to get the, uh, to be able to finance uh, these significant you know, uh, improvements, which do cost significant amounts of money. We'll follow up on that uh, as our conversation continues. Uh, Joita, that narrative I outlined at the beginning there, how true is that in your view? I think it's quite true, to be honest. And let's be clear, half of tenants saying that their buildings are rife with pest infestations, a third saying that their elevators break down monthly or more often, that's not a couple of bad apples. We've got to start stop trying to skew the narrative, narrative such that it makes it seem as though it's a minority of bad outlier landlords. This is, and this term comes up in the public inquiry for Grenfell Towers, I'll borrow it from there. This is an indication of a culture of non-compliance. Granted, these buildings that we're talking about were built in the post-war construction boom, so many of them are 50, 60, 70 years old, but had landlords been proactive and taken the initiative to maintain them from the get-go, we wouldn't have the kind of crises we have today in terms of the state of disrepair of our rental houses. And at the end of the day, it's the tenants who are held, who are uh, who hold the short end of the stick. It's tenants who have to deal with being displaced from their units, not sure when they can come back, ballooning hotel costs, and not having a way forward, and not knowing when they can be let back into their units. I am, of course, referring to 650 Parliament, but there are many similar examples across the city. So we've really got to go back and shift the narrative away from oh, poor landlords, we're not getting enough money to make ends meet. Landlords are, ma are making incredible amounts of profit. Okay, just before you shift the narrative, let me do one follow-up here. Do tenants bear any responsibility for the state of disrepair of the buildings? No, because the the, the welfare of the, the, the tenants, the right of a tenant to a, a well-maintained apartment and which is in a good state of repair, is enshrined in law. It is a landlord's responsibility to make that happen. Now, I'll concede that tenants have to notify landlords when there's a problem, but if you go back to that 2014 study we talked about, we found that, or the, Wellesley, or the, the study found that despite repeated requests and even formal complaints, landlords failed to act in a timely fashion to deal with maintenance problems. Mark, your view on that narrative that's out there, that this is a a bunch of bad landlords who are trying to mess over tenants. I can only tell you that I see this almost daily, and I refer a lot of landlords to professionals to help them when they want to invest money in buildings and they want to get a fair return. And the people that do that are telling me, and this is a good news story, that in most cases, uh, it's a very amicable hearing between the tenants who come and the landlord because the tenants want money spent in the building and they recognize they have to pay a little bit more. Do they? And, and they do. They do it, it's that. interesting. You see, a big case gets blown up because an association wants to make an example of a bad landlord. But what I'm hearing from people who do this is that most cases are solved not by the board saying we, we it should be this much increase over this many years, but an agreement between the landlord and the tenants because they recognize that it's in everyone's interest for the building to be maintained and uh, everyone to benefit. And, you know, we, we were not mentioning condominiums, but, you know, there are, as you know, many condominiums hitting 50 years now and, and more. And, you know, these are owned by people. And how many of these condominium owners go to their board of directors every year Oh, please don't raise maintenance fees. We, we can't afford to raise maintenance fees. You know, uh, happens all the time. Off, put the elevator off yeah. for, the, for another couple of years. They, they own the building. And they say, please don't raise the fees. And what happens in these buildings is tremendous special assessments come down the road to pay for these things. So, you see, it's just, it's not just a bunch of evil landlords out there who want to treat people badly. I think the culture is changing. New people recognize. And I think tenants are slowly recognizing that too. Well, let me and put we're that moving to in the right direction. Let me put that to Kristen. When, when a landlord comes to you and says, mm -hmm. how do you expect me to 
do all of the maintenance that you want me to do on behalf of the tenants in this building when, you know, all I can do is put the rents up maybe one and a half, two percent a year, mm -hmm. which isn't going to begin to cover uh, the cost of all these repairs. What do you say? I mean, this is their their property. Uh, their their responsibility is to make those investments in a timely fashion. They have an obligation to ensure that they can provide safe accommodations uh, and and clean accommodations uh, that are well maintained to their tenants. Uh, that is bound by by law. So I would absolutely agree um, that this is a, a landlord's responsibility. That the government has already put together several billion dollars worth of programs specifically for retrofit programs that includes giving a landlord incentives to do uh, sustainability audits with respect to uh, water waste consumption, GH GHS, uh, and, and what have you. Uh, there are programs to uh, provide retrofits, uh, which include uh, very competitive uh, terms of, of mortgages specifically to landlords. There are many, many different incentives that are already out there that provide uh, government-initiated programs that actually support landlords. All they have to do is make the application and the request to go there. Let me and find so, out. But, but I also yeah. want to just say, it is, I think it's important that we don't um, conflate uh, condominium ownership uh, with rental buildings. It's I think a separate issue. It, they're, they're entirely separate. Okay. And if, and Mark, no conflating. Yeah, no We're con not conflating anymore. And it's also important yeah. that the condominiums are, 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 are managed uh, by directors and, and mm -hmm. the occupants and owners of those buildings can actually have a say in how those buildings are run or not run, how, what you invest in and when you invest in it. Tenants don't have that same power. It is a very different power dynamic, and that's why we need to create, um, uh, you know, the bylaw that we did in the city of Toronto, which has now been branded as rent safe, so we can proactively work with the private property owners to do right by their tenants, and they can do a better job by creating a more professional standard and quality standard of upkeep for the building, which they haven't been doing. Okay, let me put that to Tony. You've heard there are government programs that allow landlords some subsidies to improve their buildings. Are landlords availing themselves of well, these programs? Certainly there are, and we applaud all levels of government, whether it be federal, provincial, or here in the city that have those programs. Uh, I think some are being availed, uh, availed by landlords. Probably there are, you know, needs to be more done there, both in terms of accessing the programs and, and maybe talking about other programs that should, should exist. Um, you know, the council is right in saying that, yes, the, uh, the owners of, the, of these buildings, it's their asset, it's their responsibility to maintain them. No, no doubt about that. No one wants to uh, own something and let it deteriorate, I don't think. Mm. Um, however, I think where we perhaps have some uh, differing views on is how should that all be paid for? And clearly, uh, there are different camps about that. Uh, Presumably, you want the rents to be able to go up higher to cover these costs. Well, presu uh, well in our view, certainly, that's a, that's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge to say all of this should be done, but there are these, uh, with, without acknowledging the, the limitations within the system that we currently uh, operate from. So, you know, I, I think that's uh, one, one area where perhaps we have a bit of a different view on. It's not about whether the work should be done, it's about when should it be done, how should it be done, and, and how can mm -hmm. it be paid for. Chuita, um, I'm trying to think about what the uh, vacancy rate in the capital city of Ontario is right now. I mean, it's got to be less than 1%, right? It's very mm -hmm. small. Yes, around 1.1%. 1 1.1%. 1 .1%. Yep. Okay, so it's yep. pretty close. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, it's it's tough to get a place is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. How much uh, of, the, of the background to the problem we're talking about today is dearth of supply? I think that's a big part of it. You can't make uh, something from nothing. So there's definitely a need to ensure that we are building more purpose-built rental units. I don't doubt that that's a big part of this conversation. But I just want to go back to the previous point and mention that many of the tenants who end up living in high-rise apartments are newcomers to Canada. They're seniors. They're people with, comparatively speaking, less education. They're single-parent households with uh, small children, why on earth should they ever be expected to pick up the tab and pay for much needed repairs when landlords, again, relatively speaking, are in a much better position financially? So I just want to say that, yes, the supply issue is an important conversation to be had, but I think we also need to step away from making tenants pay for repairs when it's clearly a landlord's responsibility. Uh, if I can Mark, add, please. Steve, that, and to the question you asked the earlier, when a landlord today, under the law today, puts in a lot of money into a building for security, furnace, elevators, systems, to make lives better, under the law today, they're allowed to recover 9% increase over three years on top of the government increase. So if the government increase is 2% this year, and they've been able to justify, we put all this money in the building, that will translate 
into 5% increase. So if you're paying 1,000, you'll pay 1,050 first year. Two plus three, in other words. Two plus three. Next year, you'll pay, again, from 1,050, two plus three, mm -hmm. and then in the third year. So there is incentive to me, under the law, for the landlord to do the right thing, mm -hmm. and the tenant will get a better building. Yes, their rent will go up, mm -hmm. but not 30%, not 50%, but it'll go up commensurate with the repairs that are done. Let and I think Joey that message that. has to get okay, out to people. Okay, let me ask Joey to put that. People. If, if, if the regular increase is two, and if they're allowed to split that 9% additional over three years, so three, three, and three, 5% mm -hmm. per year altogether, is that sustainable for tenants? Well, no. How many people's wages go up by 5%? It's, and to say nothing of the fact that there are many tenants in these high-rise buildings who depend on social assistance as their primary source of income. Everybody deserves a well-maintained place to live, but how many social assistance rates have, you know, has social assistance gone up by 5% in the last so many years? It has not. It's completely unsustainable, and we've got to stop shifting the burden of much-needed repairs onto tenants. It's just not acceptable. So if I can just hone just on that, on that point, um, you know, I, I agree. No one, we're not suggesting, I'm not suggesting the tenant should, should, should shoulder the entire burden uh, of these repairs. That's not the suggestion. The suggestion, though, is that uh, there should be some sharing. It should not be a one-way street. Uh, there should be some sort of, uh, you know, system. And, and yes, the AGI system, as, as Mark's talked about, uh, is, is there. What is AGI? Sorry, for? the above guideline increase that you okay. apply for. That's the the additional three percent over, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a year for three years. But you know, there are many uh, landlords who do significant improvements who don't apply for that, don't raise, you know, don't raise the rent for that. They don't pass that on to the tenants at all. They they absorb that cost. Mm -hmm. Again, this isn't a, a moment of saying, you know, pass us on the back. I'm not saying that either. But I am just pointing out that there are lots of examples where those, you know, where major repairs are done, infrastructure work is done, and the landlord simply has no uh, intention or, or interest in passing that along. The the annual, the, the above guideline increase to situation as well is not an every year situation. We're not, you know, landlords don't apply for that every year. Looking at the 5%, we're talking about increase, you know, forever. It's a, it is meant to be sort of an extraordinary situation. The list of what qualifies for that has gotten smaller and smaller. So it is a way for landlords to avail themselves to raising the rent by an additional amount. But it's not something that happens all the time. It's not something that landlords are looking to do all the time because they know that raising rents by that amount can be uh, very difficult for people. All right. Let me put another thing on the table here. And again, this is something, this is something you hear, and I want to find out from this group of guests here how accurate it is. We hear, Kristen, to you first. We hear that it is a, it is a practice among unscrupulous landlords, that mm -hmm. they will let a building fall into a state of disrepair so that tenants get sick and tired of elevators not working and cockroaches running all over the place, yeah. that they will simply move out. It's a way of forcing, in, I guess in inverted commas, forcing people mm -hmm. out because, of course, once you get a new tenant in, you can put up the rents much higher than the guideline allows. Right. How much of that happens? It's happening quite a bit. We're hearing more and more of these stories. Uh, I know my colleagues and I are hearing them from, from different uh, constituents uh, in the community. Uh, we've started to call them renovations. Uh, renovations. Renovations. So they're fake uh, uh, sort of staged renovations to force a tenant out. And uh, those tenants may not come back, even if they have the right to come back. Um, and uh, so this is a real thing. Uh, we know that... Uh, that oftentimes uh, landlords are asking their tenants to go because they want to be able to increase those rents. Um, and uh, those displacements will take over a period of months and sometimes even years as the properties are being um, renovated. And when, they, when they're finished, they, they may not be able to come back. So this is real. And, uh, and this is something that we've asked specifically, council has asked, city council has asked the province to address because we don't necessarily control uh, those matters. Those belong to the, uh, to the provincial uh, purview and their legislation. Um, and we're waiting for a response. Um, but it is important to note that uh, we are in the throes of a housing crisis. It's not just Toronto, it's actually big cities across Canada. Um, and um, the same thing is happening in Vancouver. Uh, so we are gonna have to uh, number one, uh, recognize who's a good landlord and a good operator, but there's more that are actually not good operators, and that's what we're seeing. So um, as those the housing crisis condition is here, uh, there are, there is. Um, there is an incentive for the landlords to push out their tenants. And this is what we're seeing and, and hearing across the city is that tenants are being squeezed out. Uh, it's $2,000 uh, to rent a one bedroom apartment in Toronto. And, and that's not even a great one bedroom. It's just your average one bedroom in the city. And so the incentives are very good for the landlord to, uh, to behave poorly. How much of a thing, Mark, are renovations? 
Well, I believe that, uh, and I get these, asked these questions all the time, and the courts are already aware of this red eviction problem. And it's going to be just harder for any landlord to evict tenants based on this reason because of the suspicions. Also, the act has tremendous penalties. And although one case in Kensington Market is highlighted as the great, you know, horror story, uh, there will be, I don't believe we've seen the, the end of that case where there's going to be substantial fines levied because tenants were taken advantage of. And when people come to me with this, my answer is always, look, make a deal with the tenant. There's no reason to do this. You offer the tenant enough money that they can find a place elsewhere and then do what you like. And I'm finding that good landlords will do that. They will recognize that money is paid and the tenant maybe uses this to say, oh, I'm going to get a little chunk of money. Maybe it's time for me to relocate elsewhere. And so I'm finding because most tenants do understand their rights when it comes to these rent evictions. I mean, it's out there. They know what they can and cannot do. I'm finding that while some major buildings get publicized as a horror story, for the most part, landlords are doing the right thing. They're offering tenants compensation and they're able to start a, a life again at another place. Let me get Tony on this rent eviction thing. Is it a thing? Well, certainly if you read the papers, obviously it, it is a thing, it's occurring. Uh, you don't have to, uh, it doesn't take long to open the newspaper and see a story about it. It's not something that I condone. There are very specific rules about if a landlord does want to reclaim a unit for personal use, they can under certain conditions, some of which were, were uh, changed. The previous government made some changes to that. And so, you know, my view is that uh, you need to follow the rules. If there are reasons why someone wants to reclaim a unit for personal use, and they're doing it properly within the bounds of the law, then, then they should be entitled to do that. Mm -hmm. But cases where that's, situations where that's not the case, that's not the way the system's supposed to operate. Uh, and, you know, people should be following the rules that are in place. Mm -hmm. Joina, I, we should get into some conversation here about what we can do about all of this. Mm -hmm. This is such a thorny issue because on the one hand, an apartment is a landlord's property, but it's a tenant's home. Mm -hmm. So everybody's got an interest in this, uh, greater or lesser. Do you have any solutions about how we can make this situation better? There's a couple of things to consider here. I think uh, first and foremost, there is a need for a better education for tenants so that they are made aware of their rights under the law. Many tenants don't even realize that they do have the right to complain. I think the city's rent safe program, which the council alluded to, is an important step in the right direction. It is still in its infancy, but even that program can be further strengthened and, and expanded. Um, there's a need to take into account that landlords have historically neglected their buildings. As a result, we're looking at situations where tenants pay a very heavy price uh, for historic neglect of their buildings. To that end, if landlords remain non-compliant, we do have to pursue tougher fines and stiffer penalties for landlords who aren't willing to work with the city and other stakeholders. Are, are these solutions? You know, I, I, I guess I'm trying to... I'm... I'm trying to see where these two disparate groups can be brought together in common cause. That doesn't sound like common cause to me. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of ways in which there, you have to recognize that there are landlords who don't comply with the law, and those landlords should be penalized. But of course, there's room here for all parties to come together to work together as much as possible. If governments at all three levels want to improve investment in purpose-built rental housing, I think that would be a welcome move because as we said previously, part of the, the issue here is that the stock of existing rentals is aging, but we're also not seeing new affordable rental housing being added to the mix. So there's definitely room for all parties to sit down and work together. Tony, what's something that you think landlords would support and tenants would support? Well, first of all, I think open dialogue between us is, is absolutely essential. I mean, we are, you know, the members, the private sector landlords are part of the solution. We want to be part of the solution. We think that there's a role for, obviously, for us to play, with for all governments to play, and for tenant uh, groups to play. So let's engage in, in positive discussions around how we can make things better. From the perspective of existing units and older buildings, what do we do to, how, how do we better preserve, maintain those buildings? That's one piece. And the other piece that you, Steve, alluded to earlier was we need more supply. 
I think everyone acknowledges that more supply is needed. Uh, we need to get shovels in the ground and we need to get new construction. So it's a combination of trying to unlock uh, or, or come up with solutions, whether it be, um, uh, you know, sort of faster approvals, uh, unlocking unicorn sites where, for instance, a... a What's a, a unicorn site? I was just going to explain. So okay. an, owner, an owner of a property might have a couple of towers and there's land for a third. And so, or maybe even a fourth, but let's we'll start with third. Uh, and so, things that can be done to expedite approvals of that potential site to build another tower, to get new construction built. Or other things that can be done, you know, sort of in terms of uh, making the environment better for a purpose built uh, rental to be built. But not, but also recognizing we need to talk about issues that, uh, uh, that sort of exist today around older buildings. What can we do to better, better maintain them? How can we work with governments to make that happen? How can we work with tenant groups? All of that's part of this, uh, part of the, uh, I think, the puzzle. And certainly we're, we're uh, you know, very much committed to doing that. Quick follow up here. The, uh, the new Ontario government has uh, reversed some of the policies of the previous government as it related to rent controls on all buildings, mm -hmm. right? They went back to the previous circumstance where it's now rent controls only on Pre-1990 so, buildings or something like so that? What they did is they there was an exemption that had previously existed that the Wynn government uh, eliminated. Right. So the new government has brought that back, but as of 2018, November of 2018. So it doesn't go back to... Well, it doesn't, it's not retroactive. No, it's not retroactive. So for new construction built after, or, or newly occupied suites after November of 2018, they are exempt from rent. Is that incentive enough to get builders to put up purpose-built rental buildings? It's certainly a great start. I think there's more that needs to be done in terms mm -hmm. of approval times. If it takes six years to get a project approved, not having rent control is, is not uh, the only, no, not going to sort of save that deal. But is it, a, is it a great step forward for bringing back confidence and saying to some of our members who were building condos to say maybe we're going to build an apartment now? Absolutely. Got it. Councillor, some ideas to bring both sides together here? I mean, absolutely. We need to increase the uh, the inventory, so that's just more housing overall. I think we also need to make sure that the housing that we do have is kept up and uh, and well maintained, and that's part of the rent safe program. It's supposed to uh, in, in encourage preventative maintenance. That's a big thing. Uh, empower tenants so they have a better idea of what their rights are, and uh, and also to be proactive in terms of building relationships between the landlord and the tenant, which is uh, interestingly enough something the city has to encourage because it's not happening on its own. Um, and uh, and over. Overall, to uh, to to con continue to advocate for rent control, to make sure that uh, landlords do the right thing. And one thing that we are we have observed at the City of Toronto is that there is there really isn't this full professionalization of, uh, of, of apartment owners. They, they seem to be all over the place. Some of them may be good, but many of them are not. So poor record keeping, uh, just very poor uh, in terms of maintenance programs. They're not thinking proactively in terms of what the future will hold. Uh, they have treated these, uh, these assets of theirs simply as financial instruments, so they're commodities, and they've extracted as much wealth as they can, and they've not put those investments back in. And that's largely one of the reasons why we're in this uh, very difficult difficult uh, housing crisis. Mark, when I asked Tony about putting rent controls not on future buildings and whether that would spur on any new construction, I saw you out of the corner of my eye shaking your head. You don't think it's going to work? Well, unfortunately, governments can make <coughs> rent control apply and new governments can take it right off, just <laughs> like the Liberals did. And that had a ter tremendous negative impact on the whole real estate when market. When the Liberals put controls on When the on Liberals everything. put back rent controls. So now they've been taken off for brand new construction. But I believe because it takes a few years to go from concept to build, many of these developers are just going to say, why should we take the chance when who knows who the next government's going to be? And they're going to say, you know what, we should put rent control back on. So I'm not sure this is going to be the solution. Uh, the, one of the big problems is the affordability of a home. And you have a lot of young people that really should be buying homes and condos and they mm. can't afford it because of the stress test. And as a result, they're competing in the same rental market at all, as all these other tenants. So that makes it even tighter and causes a lot of this. Mm. If that sort of was able to get solved, that would ease the pressure. And also, I feel there has to be a solution for this whole, okay, we want to fix up our building. So we want to give people notices that we want to fix up the building. Some of the tenants may say, you know what, I'm going to leave. And when those tenants just say, I'm going to leave, that landlord is going to get a tremendous windfall. Other tenants are going to say, I want to stay. And there has to be some formula, just the same way there is with this rent increase guideline, that if the landlord's going to benefit from some of the units being empty, there has to be a corresponding benefit to those tenants who are staying, who are 
inconvenience, but want to come back so that everybody wins, so that you don't just all or nothing gotcha. kind of a solution. A couple of minutes left here, and I want to touch on one more thing. Do you, do you need a special license to be a landlord today? Uh, you don't need a license. Well, it depends on where you are. It's, that's one of those answers that depends. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're in Toronto, then you have to have a license. Uh, or it's a registry, I guess, uh, yes, yes. In, in Toronto. And some other municipalities are starting to look at that as well. So it is something that we're starting to see. Do you like the idea? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we had created, as I discussed earlier, the, the certified rental building program about 13 years ago, which was our intention to sort of say, we're going to create this program. It's going to have standards. J.D. Power is going to audit our buildings to say third party to say whether you pass or fail. Okay. We really felt like that was a, and it still is a good program. We understand the city has other concerns. We've worked with the city, uh, you know, closely, or certainly my friends over at the Greater Toronto Apartment mm -hmm. Association have worked with the city on that program. So we're working with the city on it. Uh, you know, we think that uh, it is something that um, the city obviously has decided to move forward with, and we're trying to work with it as best we can. Joita, how about the idea of licensing landlords everywhere in the province? What do you think of that idea? I think that the existing regime at the city is a good start, and as I said, it can certainly be improved and expanded upon. One of the things we haven't talked about is very vulnerable tenants living in rooming houses and we often see headlines about those tenants uh, losing their lives or their property because of rooming house fires so that's the kind of housing which is one of the last remaining types of affordable housing but it's not licensed even in the city of Toronto so there's definitely scope there to expand and improve landlord licensing. How about Kristen just finally mm -hmm. is there anything you can do at City Hall to sort of shake things up and get things moving faster? I mean, a, a, approvals, I hear this mm -hmm. all the time, approvals take way too long to come through. Adds to the problems that we've been right. talking about here. As a downtown Toronto councillor, I can tell you that many of the approvals that, uh, that are being considered by city planning are now purpose-built rentals. So there are there's a development side that's responding to the need in the community. Mm -hmm. The challenge, of course, is that they're not all going to be affordable, and very few of them will be affordable. But certainly even developers who've had approvals for condominium towers are coming back in saying, we've, we've, we're going to change the, the type of, uh, of operations. We're going to turn them into purpose-built rentals. You are getting that coming we are We are certainly seeing that, and we're seeing it more and more in the city of Toronto. Now, why do you think? Um, largely because it's it's uh, it's very lucrative. I mean, the rents are through the roof. Uh, the rent control has been basically lift, been lifted, uh, and uh, we are in a massive housing crisis. And uh, these are you know these are well financed companies. They belong to uh, major shareholders and in, in investments, pension funds, and they're coming in to make those investments, and they're going to take away uh, their their tidy profits. Um, the challenge for us in the city of Toronto and right across Ontario is still the need for deeply affordable housing in the widest range, whether it's investments in transitional housing, supportive housing, uh, housing just at the, um, the average of, uh, of market rents. Uh, we need the widest range of housing, including uh, rooming houses, and, and that's what's at risk right now. So when these properties uh, do fall and when property owners do come in and say we want to add a 30-story a addition to a 30-story tower and turn it into a condominium, that is not necessarily new housing stock that uh, the, the the individual mom who's uh, raising two kids can afford. It's certainly not uh, someone that a, a, fix, a fixed pensioner can afford. So we have to fill the gap, and that's where government can come in, and that's where that's what I believe uh, we need a national housing strategy to respond to specifically to that particular missing piece of the housing market. Gotcha. That's our time, everybody. Uh, Mr. Director, you want to do this side of the table first, or you want to go to a wide shot? That's okay. That's Kristen Wong Tam, Toronto City Councillor. That's Joita Gupta from the Federation of Metro Tenants Associations. And on the other side of the table, uh, from the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario, FERPO as they're called, that's Tony Irwin, and Mark Weisletter, Senior Partner, realestatelawyers.ca. Good of Thank all you. of you to come on to TVO Great. tonight Thanks. and solve this entire problem <laughs> right here in the last 37 minutes. Just like that. Brilliant job. Well done, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.